Thank you very much, everybody. Closer to your mouth, we can't hear you. Pleased to be here at uh, the the this this uh, this correspondence of the of the uh, uh, what is it CNPS right 2016. I'm going to focus on the gravitational deflection at the sun, in particular at, at the sun, not only the stars but also just the sunlight stars in our region of the galaxy. And what you will notice that over a period of time, at least the past 100 years, most of the gravitational lensing has been observed at the, the plasma limb of the sun and of the stars, if that is altogether possible. But however, the gravitational lensing has been always historically observed at the sun. And when you take systems like satellites and you put them in deep space, most of our systems communicate, communicate using microwaves. These are centimeter wavelength systems. And as centimeter wavelengths or the frequency of microwaves in particular from uh, eight gigahertz down to uh, four or three gigahertz, these systems resonate with plasma, especially the plasma limb around the sun. And what, what you will find out that when you have microwaves from extragalactic radiation sources, these are extragalactic systems which are primarily uh, very dense objects that emit microwaves. And these are mostly extragalactic systems. And these systems are very powerful radio sources that emit very intense microwaves on a very defined frequency. And these microwaves, when they come from distant sources far away, what you notice is that if you are far away from, from a source, and, and the waves happen to be propagating in this direction, and far away from these sources, all the rays are parallel to one another for all practical purposes. But what happens is that when you observe these sources, and these sources are so way over here someplace, uh, you know, millions of light, light years away. What happens when these waves pass by stars in the sun, they tend not to be lens at all. And that's a fact. That's a fact of observational evidence. When you look at this and study it, the only lens that they find is that when these rays come in tangent and interfere with the solar plasma of the sun, and they are lens or bent. And this bending is you take this equation, you can derive this equation using classical physics. You don't have to use relativity to get this, but I'll show you how to get this equation. I managed to make a publication, and I published this same equation derived using minimum time energy deflection, a path of electromagnetic waves that propagate in a plasma. You're on a path that is minimum energy or least time. And you teach our students in graduate physics and graduate studies to calculate this in mathematical physics when you use optum or some other magnetism or, or, or Weber's electromagnetism. They learn to calculate the minimum energy path, and you get the same equation. What happens when this wave is tangent to the solar plasma limb of the sun? There's lensing and it's bent down exactly 1.75 arc seconds. And the rays that come here at the bottom is lens up 1.75 arc seconds. But it turns out there are some scientists and engineers who have a dream of using the sun as a lens or a, a distant lens to send a satellite far out into space going away from our, our present location to 500, 550 astronomical units. These rays will come together and come to a point. That is 550 astronomical units away. That's about approximately 17 times the, the orbital distance of the planet Pluto. That's quite far out there. So you can put a satellite out, and what you do, you look back at the sun, and you'll find, you look back at the sun, you'll find that any star that's way over here will have an Einstein ring around it. So you have to get away from the sun at least that distance going to a point out of the space. So let's go forward and I'll show you what I mean as we go forward. And I'm going to show primarily pictures and there won't be much mathematics here but you will see from the picture 
uh, that, that I'm talking about here. The significance of what I'm talking about, you have the significant findings, you have solar gravitational gradient. There's a solar gravitational gradient that acts on the gravitational gradient of the sun. That solar gravitational gradient, because of the gravitational field of the sun, would act directly on the solar plasma limb. And the vice versa, the solar plasma limb will act directly on the electromagnetic rays propagated within the solar plasma limb. But however, the first one, the solar gravitational gradient, does not act directly on the electromagnetic rays. It acts indirectly on the electromagnetic rays. So what you have an indirect interaction, but not a direct interaction. And that's, that's the finding that I found here on, the, on, on my research and the publications that I have made thus far. And I managed to publish in some peer-reviewed referee papers. And I'll have to give two copies of these papers. So let me show you an illustration, a diagram of what we are talking about here. You have the gravitational gradient field of the sun acts directly on the plasma lamp of the sun. That's the direct, that's the direct. Here's the plasma lamp that where you have the particles and, and the atoms in this region or because of the intense uh, thermal energy of the solar run, we're talking about approximately 5,000, 6,000 degrees Celsius. The atoms in this thing are totally ripped up the electrons. So you have, a, you have nuclei which have been ripped away of all of its electrons so you have positive and negative atmosphere here. That's the plasma, pure plasma. And you can calculate, because of the gravitational gradient field of the sun, you can calculate the minimum energy path of radiation going through this plasma. And what you come up with is 1.75 hot seconds because of the, the effects that it shouldn't be any surprise at all because most of the lensing and the gravitational deflection have been observed in the plasma of the sun. But the rays propagated way out here, going out into deep space, going away from the, crab, crab, uh, the plasma limb of the sun, these rays tend not to be affected at all, at least in, at least in the micro ray region, not affected at all by the gravitational equation. So let's go on and we'll talk about that as we go forward. This is what we observe. What we observe has been for the last nearly century now, you find that these rays out here, the electromagnetic rays propagated in plasma free space all over, right? And our observation of space is not lensed at all by the gravitational field of the sun. That's the gist of what I'm going to be talking about as we go forward. Here's what we, what we have done experimentally. You can set up experiments and put in space, and what you have is a, a long path interferometer. And you can put a satellite up, and if you have the sun, and you have an array of source of a source of a, a mini microwaves in this region going far away in this direction for millions of light years away, extragalactic sources that emit microwaves. These microwaves here are not affected by the gravitational effect of the sun. But however, if you place a satellite and, and let it move in this, in this direction, going in this direction, what you'll find out, when you pass down through this region and you detect this ray, you will notice this ray has been deflected 1.75 arc seconds downward, so you have a negative sign here and you get a negative pulse. Going down further, there's no signal because all the, all the emissions coming from those deep stars have been blocked by the sun, so there's no signal here at all. But down here, you get another signal you find that this ray has been deflected upward. So you get a positive deflection of 1.75 arc second, right? This one is deflected up and that's deflected down. But if you extend this out into deep space, these two rays will come to together at to a point, 550 uh, 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 astronomical units away, approximately 17 times the orbital radius of Pluto. So this is what you can do. You can take this long path interferometer and do so. And the Earth, the Earth could be uh, have antennas on on board, and these antennas could be out in a field somewhere out, probably in South America somewhere, some some place where you get free of emission of interference. You get to get away from large cities where you have large cities and towns. These systems could be will get interference from broadcast systems, so you want to avoid that. 
that could be an inner farm, that, that could be, this could be the path of the Earth as it moved downward. And in the satellite system, these, these, these quasars, these distant extragalactic quasars, would be point-like sources emitting these microwaves, and you, did, you actually detect this. But note here, the most important thing to remember is they get only 1.75 arc seconds deflection. Not one half of that, but exactly 1.75 arc seconds deflection. And not more than that, and not, min not less than that. And the impact parameter is always equal to the impact parameter which corresponds to the gravitational radius of this, the gravitational uh, limb of the sun. And the radius of the sun is approximately, what is it, 950,000 uh, kilometers. That's the, that's the impact parameter, and not out here. There's no bending out here in deep space away from the, 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 the plasma limb of the sun, only at the plasma limb. So let's go forward, and we're gonna talk about that as we go forward. What's important here to remember is that our sun, uh, any, any star, that a star-like sun with the same mass and the same radius will have a gravitational potential gravitational potential of the sun looks like this. In the textbook, if you go close to the sun, you start out here, and you notice the gravitational potential of the sun is going to go enormously high, very big. If you go away from the sun, the orbital position of the planet Mercury and Venus and Earth, one astronomical unit is Earth. At this position of the Earth, the gravitational potential of the sun is like this. But if you plot this, take this box and blow this box up. If I blow this box up, I have the Earth here at one astronomical unit. Then I have the gravitational potential plot together with the gravitational potential of the Sun and also the gravitational potential of the Earth. It turns out that the gravitational potential of the Sun is nearly 14.14 times greater than the Earth. So the Sun the gravitational potential of the sun is very big in comparison to that of the Earth. But that's the gravitational potential. So the sun, nothing, nothing, nothing outweighs the sun in our particular location, in our orbit, at, at possibly one astronomical unit. But not so if you calculate what is known as the gravitational gradient. That's different. So if you have gravitational potential, you have just V, right? But you take the gravitational gradient, you have to take the partial derivative this with respect to Z, the point going away from the source. So let's show you how that works. The gravitational potential gradient is as follows. The definition of gravitational potential gradient is the following. If I take the Earth, for example, and I take the gravitational potential gradient, you can find out what the gravitational potential is by, by taking the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and the distance from the source. That's the, that's the field, right? This is the Earth, and this is the gravitational potential of the sun. But however, you notice the sun outweighs, you know, much bigger than that of the Earth. But however, if I take the, the difference, show the distance between, the difference between these two is approximately 14 times. One is, the, the sun is 14 times bigger than that. Now let's go forward with the gravitational potential. Here, you define the gravitational potential as follows. You take the different parts of the derivative of the gravitational potential of the sun with respect to z. And that z, that's the distance r, which is one astronomical unit away from us, right? That's the distance from us to the sun. You can take that one AU. And if you compare that with the gravitational potential gradient of the Earth, what you find out, the gravitational potential of the Earth is much, is, is actually, the sun is much less than what the gravitational potential radius of the Earth is. If you take that distance from the distance from the Earth is only the radius of the Earth, and here this is one astronomical unit. Comparing these two, you come up with a surprising difference. You take the distance between the Earth and look at the gravitational gradient potential of the Earth, and compare that with the gravitational gradient potential of the Sun. You find that. It's almost a uh, thousand times, one thousand uh, six hundred times bigger than the sun. The Earth has a great, a large, very large gravitational potential gradient, a 
And this is the reason why if you put satellites in a deep space with atomic clocks running on board, the Earth has a profound effect on these clocks, how fast these clocks would run. So this, this is very important. So I'm going to come back to that in a second to show you what the difference here. This is to explain why this is important. The reason why this is important, look at the from, from, from general relativity, you take the, the gravitational bending, light bending, that's four times the gravitational constant type of mass divided by RC squared. You can derive this equation general using general relativity, but we don't have to use general relativity. You have you guys have other methods you can you come up with the same equation using alternative methods and schemes. But the integrated effect of this, you take the light beam that's coming from a distant star, you find that it's bending because of the mass the, 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 the mass here, which can have a radius of R. This is a uniform mass like the Earth. It's pretty, pretty much uniform except for the core of the Earth. Most of our planets in the solar system have an iron core, but some core that's very massive. But however, let's just assume that this, this is uniform mass, right? There's bending coming from a distant star, and let's talk about that delta one. And there's also bending going away. So during the torch, a beam is bent around this, this mass, and going from the seat in the mass, it's bent down. So if you take these two, and add them up, you come up with 1.75 arc seconds. It's bending, going, approaching, and receding. But guess what? You take this same mass and squeeze it down, make it more dense, right? If you want to make this mass, you can take the Earth, for example, and squeeze it down to a smaller mass, and put that mass inside of a Gaussian sphere that has the same radius of the Earth. What you do, you measure the same gravitational field on, on board, on, on set, standing on this gravitational uh, potential uh, surface, right? But if I, if I squeeze it down to a to something like a, 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 a neutron star, or some kind of neutron particle, the mass of the Earth, the whole Earth, given the theory of what a neutron neutron density is, the Earth could be something less than less than a basketball, size of a basketball, maybe even even a golf ball, depending on how you do this. But this particle could be a very small particle like a black hole or something like that, mini miniature black hole. Theoretically, that miniature black hole, the same mass as the Earth, could be placed inside of a Gaussian sphere, and the same gravitational potential would be at the surface. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and this mass that, is a, that shows you that, that the, the Gaussian potential, that the same principle is <coughs> used when you have a, 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 a particle charged particle <coughs> closed in a Gaussian surface, and that Gaussian surface tells you that the the potential at the surface just depends on the mass that is enclosed. But gravity has a similar principle as that of electromagnetism, but gravity enclosed in a Gaussian sphere is depending on the mass enclosed. It doesn't care what the size of the mass is. It just, it, it just cares that it cares about the size of the mass, but it doesn't care the mass. This mass could be, it could be as long as it's point light. It doesn't even have to be a spear. It could be, it could be. This could shape like a wedge or something. As long as this this size <coughs> is very small in comparison to the radius of spear, and as long as it's point light, this 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 principle will always hold. So let me go to the next one and now now click forward on that. Let's combine this previous uh, slide with the slide which is not the principle of reciprocity. If I were to look at some star, just a star out here, and you, you said you said the lenses, lenses are going to take place, this telescope, the observer of this telescope, he sees the source, but he sees the image of the source here. But the source is actually located behind the lensing, but when looking out in deep space, it would be apparent, it is apparent to the observer that the lensing images here located at this point. Let's say you, you were to shoot a laser beam back in the same direction. So I see the beam, send a beam back in the same direction. It should take exactly the same path going back the other way. That's the principle of reciprocity. And anybody who designs lenses, that principle of reciprocity is very, very important. To design telescopes put up in a deep space, we use this principle of reciprocity to design lenses. When you have a system of lenses and you want to figure out how to best make the best 
telescope that makes the best telescope that can amplify your, your signals out in deep space, you use that principle. That works for gravitation as well as light. So going forward to the next one. So comparing this to what we just talked about, reviewing this, take the same principle on approach and receding of the light wave. You get both of these added up to add up the four times G M over R squared. See, this is the light bending of general relativity, designed by relativity. You can design that you can you can derive this by general relativity. And this, this, this applies to all of these masses. What's, the, what's, the, what's constant about these, they all have the same mass. Even though this mass may be more dense than the first mass, it doesn't care about the density. What it cares is, is about is the quantity of mass that you have in, in close. So, summarizing what I just said in the last four slides, five slides, is this. If you have a star that is burned out, when a star system depletes all of its energy, it's going to collapse down to something like, like a, a white dwarf or some kind of dwarf system. And that dwarf system, it could be the size of our sun when it's brand new. But once it dropped down, all that mass could be something probably not, not much bigger than the Earth. And when this thing collapses down, the gravitational bending should be approximately the same because it would, not, it would deplete some of its energy and some of its mass but probably on about maybe five to ten percent of this mass would be depleted, but most of the mass is still going to be there. So it becomes a dwarf star, or it could become a black hole if it's a pretty size of a star, that is. So, some, summarizing what I just talked about, we have this system with the cows, the principle of the cows, and the principle of the rest of the process that we use both of these, and I'm going to talk about what we're talking about here. Let's take a look at what gravitational lensing is all about. Here we have this distant source out here, and it says it's a red star, and it's going to emit red packages of light. This could be packages, you want to call them photons, or you can call them uh, electromagnetic packets. And, it, and it's, it's dumping out all these waves, and they're going in all directions. These waves are going in all directions. But what happens, I've got a massive source right here in the middle where this X is. This is some kind of massive device that is caused from gravitational lensing as predicted by general relativity. Relativity uh, predicts this is going to happen in a vacuum. Let's say the relativity were correct. If that is so, I can place this mass here. And if I place the mass halfway between the observer, which is here, and the source, which is over here. And let's say that the lensing device, or the mass, right here in the middle of it, it turns out that the light bending be such that these rays, these photon packets, will come and find its way to the observer, right? Along this path, you can take this path or you can take this path going down. Both of these paths are, are reciprocal to one another. I can draw a line between the observer and the source, and I can flip this around, and this 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 curve will flip on top of this curve, and this will be exactly the same. But however, between these observer and the source, if I take the uh, what is what is known as the the the, the uh, line of uh, uh, reciprocity, or the line which is, which defines the symmetry between these two, where I can take that line, this path will be such that this plant, if I flip this leg, this this curve from here, this point where the observer is. We flip around this line, which is a symmetry, a line of symmetry, and this point we go over there, right? So it's, it's relativity is a symmetric principle when you divide these rays, and that's what they're teaching the textbooks, and this is very important. So looking at what's, what a observer see, what a observer, a observer actually see, it doesn't see a point. If this is the case, the observer should see an Einstein ring looking through the eyeball and his lens telescope that he's looking at, you should see an Einstein ring, right? And not a point source, you should see a ring, a red ring. And that's what you should see according to the prediction of general relativity. So let me go on and we, we talk about this. The impact parameter, what's important about this? The, the main main point that I want to make clear here is, is that when you look out in deep space, you see all these lensing devices that have been defined as lensing, 
And some of this stuff has nothing to do with relativity at all. There are a lot of objects out there in deep space that can cause an energy. And there's some, some gas bubbles out there that it's not even matter. It's not even mass. It's not solid mass. It's just a, a, bubble, of, a bubble of gas. And the gas could accumulate to whereby you can get an enormous amount of gas, the most like hydrogen, helium, and other gases, neon, whatever. If there's enough gas, it will become more and more dense, and the gas will squeeze down. And if there's enough energy, these particles will squeeze in such a way. And if there's enough density, it could ignite into a star. So this is how stars are being born. So stars are being born by these gas particles. So we go back, let's go, let's go forward and I'll talk about this. So the review of what I just recently talked about, we have the solar lensing that is produced by, by the, the gravitational gradient of the sun. And this gradient is probably five, 6,000 degrees Celsius where you have ionized particles in this, in this lamp or the lamp, what it's called. It's a thin plasma lamp. And this is, this is one, if I could put a Gaussian sphere around here, it has exactly one radius of the sun, right? If I increase the Gaussian sphere twice the radius of the sun, Instead of having a, a lensing, which is 1.75 oxide, the lensing out here would be exactly one half of this divide. So instead of getting 1.75 oxide here, I should get 0 0.85 in this place here. But if I increase the Gaussian speed three times the radius of the sun, I should get lensing also according to general relativity. This lensing should be one third of 1.75 oxide. If I go to four times, the radius of the sun. I should get one fourth, and so forth and so forth. So what happens if you go further? For, for increased impact parameters, the lensing should get less and less and less. And this is easy to see the current means of observation, and we don't see that. In our sun, we don't see it at the center of the galaxy. I show how relativity fails. And I managed to put some papers on this thing. Effect. And the relativity theory, people who support relativity are fighting against this. This is what we see. We see the sun causing lensing at the solar plasma limb, right? But we see no zen, no lensing observed at all out here, no lensing. These waves are coming right by us. And the question here is, main question, the, the, the primary question is, where are the Einstein rings? Where are they? So in summarizing that, we have the lensing at the plasma limb of the sun, 1.75 oxide. No lens in here and no lens in out there. So the light thing is due to the sun's gravitational field, the, the gravitational gradient acting on the, on the plasma limb. And this is what we observed for the last 100 years so far. Here's a, here's a NASA, you can go to NASA website and NASA got it, published this. If you go to this website, which is science.nasa.gov, the science of news, NASA at, at NASA 2004. This has been up since 2004. 25 March, I think, the Einstein um, people who, who studied Einstein and lensing at the sun, they find out you have a star here, and that star appears to move, right? And this, this sun approaches the star, and it seems like the star actually moves, but the star doesn't move. What happens is that you see the apparent position of that star because the light is bending, coming towards the sun, and it's, it's, it's coming towards our telescope, and we're looking in an apparent direction of that star, right? But however, if, well, theoretically, if this star, if the Earth, if the sun were, were lensing enough, and there's a star behind this thing, you should see Einstein ring around the sun. We don't see any of those, and those, those are not visible. It, and it's, in our region of space, it's not visible. And the question is, where are the Einstein rings? Let's talk about this uh, again, review of what we just talked about. So if we had the sun, any star the same mass and radius of the sun, uh, one, you know, one, one uh, solar radius and one solar mass, any star that has one solar radius and one solar mass calls lensing, and that lensing would be 1.75 oxide. No matter what the star, so far as we know, all the stars in our solar system, in our galaxy, region of galaxy, is pretty much like, like the sun. There's not much difference between the sun. And the focal lengths F and R of the sun are expressed in the same units. If you express those in the same unit, the 
stop the Minnesota mass, the Minnesota mass, the Minnesota leaves, will cause cleansing, and it will come to a focus at 550 uh, astronomical units. So the, the, so the focal length of our sun is 550 astronomical units, approximately 17 times the radius of the orbit of radius of, 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 of the planet Pluto. It's the most distant planet. So if we want to do this, and you can use this as a lens, a microscope, and you have a distant star out here somewhere in, 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 in deep space, and you come out here in deep space and put an observer here, you can use the sun as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a lens. And that sun, you can see objects way over here someplace, and it would, it would, it would amplify it for you or magnify it for you. This, this theoretically is placing some kind of observer right out here. And it's, it's been the dream of uh, astronomers to go out in these places and put some kind of probe out here or some kind of observer instrument, take a camera, turn it back, and look at the sun. You'll see all kinds of stuff far over here. This would work according to observers using the sun as a lens. So uh, keep that in mind. And I won't bore you with the mathematics, but you can do the math and you can go through and look at this. You take the, the distance of the sun, the, the radius of the sun, and so forth, the, the, the acceleration of force on the surface of the sun. And, and you go, it's, it's, it's total gravity of the sun. It's, it's very intense, very intense. But if you take it, the acceleration effect, one of our effect of the sun, this is what it looks like. And if you observe the lensing, going out in deep space where you have this, this radius increase from going out in space, there's no lensing up here at all, right? But however, at the, at the limb of the sun, you get this lens up. Is that what you have, according to relativity, it predicts 0.88 arc seconds out here, where you have this distance. But guess what? This doesn't happen. You don't see this at all. So that's a problem. The relative that's quiet about this, that they're not talking about. And this is another thing called the Shapiro effect. What this Shapiro effect is, is that we put our satellites in deep space. Most of our systems in space, we communicate with each other within, between our satellites in deep space. We use microwaves. And these microwaves, it turns out that depending on what the frequency of these microwaves are, the frequency of the microwave, when this microwave passes close to the surface of the sun, the sun is emitting, the streams up, it's, 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 a, it's a nuclear furnace, and it's ejecting out what is called um, um, uh, the, 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 the electron, electron clouds, right? These, these, are, these are solar winds, and the wind is blasting. You can put a sail in the space, and you put the sail in the right place, and you can use this solar wind, and you can propel yourself through space if you're careful of how you, how you renew. These winds will put satellites they use the wind, the solar winds, to correct the position of satellite by putting up like an umbrella-shaped device, and using the solar wind and the prominence that would explode on the surface of the sun, ejecting out all these particles. And some of these things fly by the Earth with supersonic speeds up to maybe a hundred times supersonic speed, sometimes a thousand times supersonic speed. And this is very incredible. It turns out satellite broadcasting signals out of Earth, right? You find out there's a delay between this satellite signal going to the Earth, and as it's, this it's beam comes close to the sun, that the delay increases. This is called the Shapiro delay. And the Shapiro delay has absolutely nothing at all to do with general relativity. This is a different effect in the general relativity. Um, because of this, if you take the, the, the satellites on different frequencies, right? have 8 gigahertz instead of 4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. This delay depends on the frequency of the satellite. The relativity has failed that already. The relativity does not predict that. The frequency dependent. This is a frequency dependent system. And summarizing what I just talked about, I just summarize that you have this the light bending because of the solar limb, and you have, you have what is known as the superior delay. And this superior delay, this propagation of the transit time effect is both the frequency and impact parameter depend. They're both depending on frequency and they depend on impact parameter, both of them. And that relativity does not, does not treat that possibility. And this is what generally happens when you 
you have light bending on these rays, and this, this happens in optics, and it happens in microwave, right? But it happens in, so what happens? You have an electron density profile of, of this, these particles that are ejected from the sun. This is a plasma system that's ejected out past all the nine planets of the solar system. So you get this enormous venue that the, 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 the light wave, the, the, the beam coming from the sun, you can have an index of fraction associated with it. But kind of is, guess what, from optical frequencies and infrared and ultraviolet frequencies, that index of refraction is approximately exactly 1.0, 1, exactly 1.0. But for microwaves, it turns out this is a little bit bigger than one. Microwaves resonate with plasma, and relativity does not predict the different microwave frequencies and so forth. And this is the data, which handled that. You can go to my website, and I have this on my website. The data and information describes how you calculate that for 2.2 gigahertz and 8.8 .8 gigahertz. And for both of these frequencies, they have an enormous difference between the two. So it is frequency dependent, right? And therefore, relativity fails again. Relativity is independent on frequency. It should be, right? But this is not, this is, this is frequency dependent. So here, to summarize all what I just talked about, most rays coming from distant stars, let's say you have stars that are so far away up here. If you take these rays and you look at them, it's the rays that will get bent will hit the plasma limb of this star, right? But the other rays will keep going. There's no bending at all unless these rays happen to coincide with some plasma limb or some star, some star similar to our sun. If this ray is mm -hmm. close to this star, it would be bending. If this ray is bent, let's say, four, four light years away, the light coming from these rays would be, would be bent away and we would, it would never reach our telescope. These rays, we would never see this. But these rays, we will see the distant stars from this way because of these rays. But the rays that that get scattered or bent by near systems out in deep space become invisible to us, and we can never see any evidence because these, these rays would be bent away from our observation. That's what happened. And that shows you the answer, the reason why you don't see Einstein rings in the star sphere skies, one star right behind another star should have a ring associated with it. The reason why you don't see that ring, number one, it has an impact parameter it could be for the star, but it is the radius of the star, and it's not bent in deep space, in deep space and because of this. The rays will pass by these stars in deep vacuum space. In vacuum space, there's no bending whatsoever. So the question is, where are the Einstein rings? And that, that's the answer, where the Einstein rings are. And this is the reason why you don't see the Einstein rings, because light that goes by, by these stars and is way above Amazing the plasma limb of these stars, it has no, no, no bending whatsoever. And this troubles relativity. That, that's a problem for relativity right now. They can't explain that. And this data explains that exactly. And here, this is a calculation showing that what I did. I managed to publish this paper, and I calculated the using the minimum energy principle. You can derive this equation without using relativity. And that's what I did. I'll take you have uh, you can show there's no direct interaction between light and gravitation. It's indirect interaction only. And on page you put in my book on page 12a in the, in the appendix and at 14, 14a, 13a, 14a. I, I, I showed the calculation using this bending effect, using the minimum energy path or the least time path, published in textbooks that undergraduate students. And can do this calculus. If you keep this assignment to students, they can do that. And in high school, we have bright students in high school that are already studying uh, mathematical geometry, and also graduate students beginning with physics in a graduate school. And this is an easy problem to do. So what you do, you take this, this effect, the integrated effect of gravitational field of a mass m, and I integrate it to say, from, from the radius of the star on out to infinity. Going from the radius, radius of the star on out to infinity, you start with this equation. And you take that maximum velocity, the escape velocity of a particle, going at the, you have an exploding uh, a nuclear furnace on board the sun. 
And these products, have been, they bound to the sun because of the sun's intense gravitational field. And most likely, it's not going to escape. But some particles do manage to escape because of the solar wind. So you can calculate this by plugging in the light wave frequency redshift. And you can come up with the redshift by, by like, like what, what uh, 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 you just spoken by, you had, uh, you have uh, uh, a furnace that you have a window on both sides of the furnace, and you heat these particles up, and you have massive velocities of the particles. And since these particles are moving, they'll be moving to secondary sources, and the, the sources that are moving towards you would be red shifted up in frequency. The ones that are moving away from you would be down shifted in frequency, but coming from the other end, you have up shifted frequency multiplied times one plus v over c times one minus v over c. What you get is one minus v squared over c squared. That's a red shift, no, no matter how you look at it. The higher the temperature you make, the greater this red shift is, and that is actually a red shift. And you can plug in these equations, you come up with the bending effect. And that, that's, that's easily calculated. You go to the west side, and I'll show you how to calculate it. You come up with this equation. You get a receding plus the effect of approaching Bind those two effects, and this minus minus or minus sign will cancel out, and you get plus when you come up with four gm over rc squared. First of all, each one of these contribute two gm over rc squared. This has a minus sign or sign to it because this 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 guy is on approach. This guy is receding. This is plus gm over rc squared. You combine these two effects, and you come up with four gm over r squared, and that's the bending based on the least time effect. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna summarize what I have. This is, this is summary right here. I'm gonna take one, one or two more minutes and I'm, I'm done. So what happens if you look, look beyond our, our uh, solar system, this object is located some 26,000 light years away. This is the most intense observed uh, object in our, in our solar system. This thing has been looked at, or if you, did, if you see this clock here, the time is steady. Started from 1992, coming up to 2000. What is it? 2006. Yes, something like that. This thing has been this 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 is this this um, this this image right here is about 10 years old. This thing today, this star has completed one orbit and it's on the way to the second orbit right now. Since we observed, it takes approximately 17 years to make one complete orbit. This thing is called S2. It's on the second orbit, and it's going to be in its third orbit uh, pretty soon now. So we looked at this thing, most intense observed object in the solar system right now. That's interesting. That's called S2. But look at this thing here. This thing comes in. It's called S3. That thing comes in so fast, and it loops around this object. Something is located right here. They don't know what it is. But whatever it is, they determine the mass of this thing. How to determine the mass? If you measure the, the, the velocity of these stars, and some of these stars are more, more massive than our sun, some of them are 10 solar masses, some of them are almost 20 solar masses. These stars are whirling around this thing. There's about 22 stars here. Uh, they're all on the elliptical path. All, all uh, these things, all, all these things on Kepler path, every one of them. And what you don't see here, you see no evidence of Einstein whatsoever. There's no, there's no, no bending, no lensing effect, no distortion of what's going on around here. But what's interesting about this star, this thing comes around, and when it puts around here, it's going 3% of the velocity of light. What did that tell you? This thing is going so fast, 3% of the velocity of light when it puts around here. That tells you, since these stars is massive as the sun, whatever this is, that's one of the best vacuums in the universe, right? Because these stars can move so fast, if there were any kind of uh, dust particles or anything around there, these stars would disintegrate. Right? That tells you this got to be one of the best vacuums in the universe. So what we determine is we have no light bending in vacuum space, only in plasma. The plasma then by the sun, but we have light bending. But out of deep space, there's no lens in whatsoever. You don't see any lens in here. But what the textbook tell you this is the following. That this is this is twenty this is twenty six thousand light years away. And what you see here this is what went on 26,000 years ago. So I'm, I'm just about done. This is the thing long enough. So 
what's happening there? You have this star coming in, and when it comes to near the, the, the after the distance of this, this, whatever this is, it's going 3% of the velocity of light. So I make my way forward on this. This is what you should see if relativity were correct. If relativity were correct, some of these stars would call some lenses. Right? You should see them. Right? This is what you don't see. This is in the textbook. Right? These are animated images of what relativity should look like, and this is what you don't see in relativity with this device. And this is this is what you this is in textbooks too. You see all these things all over the textbook. You see this image. The, the repetition and interaction, and, and it's a black hole here, and that star passes behind the black hole. The light coming from that star should be a lens, or some sort of distortion should take place. And that's what you should see in relativity with the gospel. But this is what you do see. You see no, no effects whatsoever. Right. So let me, let me go forward and I, I finish. This is what you should see also, no effect whatsoever. So uh, we, we take the, 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 the problems to give them to the students, and you have the mass and we between the telescope and the source, right? And you have this bending, and this bending has an axis of symmetry. You take that axis of symmetry, like a rope, take this thing around, the axis of symmetry, this point will go over here, and that point will go over here. And this, this is a symmetrical bending equation. It's easy to calculate. So let me click forward. This is what we see. This is what this is what we are wrestling with right now. You can calculate these these tank using lens and tools like this, and from infinity, these like come to a point at the source. Right? And you have you have observer here and observer there. Both of these observers will observe lensing, but both observers will see something a little bit different. He will calculate a different equation than this guy would calculate, but both of them will calculate. Both of them will see Einstein ring. So I'm just five minutes. So any questions? I can I can take questions if you have. Yeah, we have three minutes for questions. Okay. All right. So. Uh, yes. Is there a similar explanation for the alleged lensing by galaxies as opposed to yeah, the alleged yeah. lensing by yeah, that, that's by good. Very good question. Microphone what, up to your mouth, please. Yeah. When when you look at galaxies, what they call lensing galaxies, there's a lot of uh, objects out there that cause lensing. Not only the gravity will cause it, but the, the lensing can be caused by the gases in space. It turns out that uh, the mass of the universe, what that is about 90% of the mass of the universe that is not visible. What we see is only 10%, but there's 90% out there. But we know that when you get close to these galaxies, the region between the galaxies where you have bright images from it, you have scattering light and one of these is uh, it's just, uh, there's an x-ray uh, scattering that is present. Yeah. So a uh, number of groups uh, of uh, astrophysicists were actually seeing much longer in the past than the current uh, science admits, uh, in yes, particular sure. the Big Bang and so on. Right. So uh, that, that is based on the gravitational lensing. So right. how you would explain that? I mean, uh, apparently by talking about uh, uh, magnifying effects, so apparently they may have be having that magnifying effect so that can see much farther away in the past yeah. than, than, than the they, they claim they can see. If these things were actually lenses, they claim they can see. But what happened? If you examine these images very closely, what you'll see is different wavelengths. If you put a filter in front of them, and you filter out the optical wavelengths and you looked at the only the ultraviolet and you looked at the only infrared, and it's an entirely different image. So that I image actually fails all the way. Yeah, I actually wanted to see if that is like fact, uh, right. would it uh, more su even more support your your insights and your, your, yeah, your but what, uh, about, about just uh, yeah. re lensing as, as as a refraction effect, right? In fact, but relative to predict, the lensing should not be, be a function of frequency. It should be independent of the frequency. Oh, okay, this is but you, by you that. get the infrared only yeah. or the ultraviolet only, which you see some talent yeah. and all these things are laid to rest. Really to <laughs> to no, cross. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. Yeah. It would well, be anyway, the, uh, let me uh, skip, it, skip forward enough, and, uh, just and uh, show you uh, what's the, uh, happening here. Uh, this uh, Albert Einstein predicts, uh, he said that the velocity of light is not constant in all frames of reference. It's not a tiny bit dependent on the velocity of light source that all materials are wrong. And the list is from the fact that I claim this, I think it's from the from the clearly it's just so many kinds of rock, so soon it's like this in the fast. That's what he said in general. So that's, that's it. One, one more question. 
So just quote what he said. <laughs> any more? Any more questions? No. Yeah. One more. One more. I that's it. Get the last word about uh, gravitation and Does it mm -hmm. affect the velocity of light? Yeah. Being, being bent. Yeah. What, what you said. You have the light electromagnetic electromagnetism a different wavelength. Relativity predicts all wavelengths will be, be bent by all wavelengths. Whether it's, whether it's microwave, radio waves, optics, um, infrared, ultraviolet, all of them will be bent. So you can you can hold hold them to that, and you can look at these regions in different different wavelengths, and what you see something different for all the different wavelengths. Okay, uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much.